Hey now everybody, welcome back to Brand New Take Game Podcast. And this week I welcome Bonnie McFerrin to the show from Legends of the Fall TV. Recently Bonnie was just up in Alberta and she put an arrow, ten ringed, an Alberta mule deer. An Alberta giant I should say. Just an absolute mega and super excited to have Bonnie here and share that story with us on the podcast. You know, Bonnie's just such a great hunter and her and Mike and the whole crew there always do such a great job. It just seems like they just really enjoy hunting and it was super excited to have them on the show and have Bonnie share this hunt with us. So hope you guys enjoy. Guys, we're live, brand new Take Aim podcast and excited to have one of my longtime friends on the show. Officially on the show, we've tried before, but excited to have Bonnie McFerrin from Legends of the Fall TV. How are you doing, Bonnie? I'm good. How are you, Brandon? Doing good, doing good. Super happy to have you. I know we've tried before. We actually tried to do a live podcast, and for whatever reason that day, probably just craziness at ATA, it just didn't work out, but excited to have you here finally. We've been friends for a long time, but we're stoked to have you on the show. Well, I really appreciate you having me. I'm glad that we can finally connect, and I I think that sometimes at ATA it does get kind of crazy busy, and then, you know, it just didn't happen that time, but I'm glad that I could be here today. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, not a problem. So, I know you're in Texas, so what is the weather like? Because it's been like 90 here, which is strange for September. It just cooled down actually about two days ago, but I assume you guys are probably still pretty hot down there. Yes, we are. We're still in the 90s. As a matter of fact, um, I was gone all last week, and we had a lot of flooding, but when I left for Alberta, last week it was it was still in the triple digits here so when i got to alberta it was it was like i was in you know air conditioning because it was literally 30 35 degrees cooler so the whole week i was like i'm just going to enjoy this because i know i'm going back to the oven (laughs) yeah good lord yeah that's crazy yeah you probably got there and was like it's a little chilly yeah i you know i i do like everywhere i go i have to you know during my hunting travels i have to kind of adjust to the weather because i'm always coming from such hot weather and i'm kind of i guess i'm kind of thin a thin skin texan so i was out there when it was like it was probably like 49 degrees and i was in a coat (laughs) you know right yeah You could probably tolerate those temperatures a lot better than me. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little used to it. Like uh, this morning, which is funny because it's warm during the day, but this morning it was like it was 55. And the day before that it was 51. So it, get, it snapped really fast. It just is what it is. You get used to it really quick, and we're we're pretty used to that kind of swing like that. That happens so fast. But uh, yeah. we're definitely going to talk about the Alberta thing in one minute. But while we're talking about Texas, um, I know you guys hunt. Down in South Texas, do you guys have anything you're looking forward to on the farm down or ranch down there this year? We do. Um, an opening weekend of archery is actually this weekend. So. Oh, is we it really? It is. Yeah. Our uh, the guy that has filmed with us for a long time, Harmon Blanton, he'll be flying in on Friday, and we're gonna actually try to have some of the kids filming. Have you know, Mike and I will be filming. We have you know some bucks on the hit list that we've kind of been looking at and. Um, just, you know, it's always good to try to get them, you know, to try to be able to hunt early because they're a lot more patternable, you know, um, even For though sure. South Texas ruts a little bit later than like say the Midwest and, you know, we still have a little more time, but usually we, we try to get there on opening weekend because then we'll have other travels, you know, different places that we're going and focusing on. So, but yes, we do, we, we do have, we do have a few bucks that we're looking at. That's Hopefully cool. We'll have some luck. Yeah, for sure. I know that, like what we were just talking about, Alberta and even Michigan, the cooler temperatures, I would probably die. Like if I was headed down there to hunt with you guys next week, I would probably freak out because I'd be like, it is so hot. I don't know how in the world you guys do this, but I'm sure you guys are so used to it. The heat's just just part of the hunt. It's not a big deal. Yeah, it is. We're we're used to it. And the one, the one thing is with, with all the rain and everything, we're just always, you know, what's the mosquito level going to be like? Oh, my gosh. Is it going to be, you know, where you just can't even hunt? Or I, I think we'll be good. We'll see. Well, that's good. Now, do you guys on your property down there, do you guys kind of, I assume you do, but you can get into it a little bit more, but just follow the weather and kind of some of the weather predictions like that. It is a cold weather snap down there? Is it as minimal as like something as five degrees? And you guys key in on stuff like that? really we really okay. don't that much Brandon no uh-uh. because we don't really get cooler weather at all right <laughs> yeah yeah it's gonna be you know it does cool down and it'll be chilly in November a little bit December but 
really in this part of Texas that we're in, even where we live, you know, it's it's hot all the way through Halloween usually. Okay, I gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I mean, I figured it was, but I didn't know if something like that would get deer on their feet. But uh, I assume five degrees at 105 or the 100, it's it's not really any different. <laughs> yeah, but what gets? Uh, I mean, they're obviously having to go to water, and yeah, for you sure. Know, I don't, we have a we have we put in a lot of water just because you know a lot of people that don't hunt areas like this don't understand that you know how important that is. Things, how yeah. important it is, you know. So, anyway. For, for sure, yeah. Well, one good thing, I mean, w- what you alluded to earlier in the start of this is you guys had that late rut. So, I mean, how kind of neat for you guys. You can leave and kind of get to bounce around all of the Midwest and then head back home and, and you guys have another rut waiting for you. Mm-hmm. That's I don't know. Awesome. We kind of highlighted that on the show a little bit because it's we do. We basically get to hunt two ruts, you know. Yeah, so, how neat. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing. Yeah, for sure. So are you guys, do you have your kind of fall already planned out, Bonnie? Are you going to be, I would assume, back in Kansas, or where are you guys going to be? We, we do have our fall planned out, and this this year is a little bit light. We um, It's the first year in so long, Brandon, that we haven't done Kansas. Oh, cool. We actually, we had a farm in Kansas, and we sold it in the spring, um, because we were finding that we were just not spending enough time there, and, you know, it just wasn't, it, it just didn't make sense anymore. So we we had a lease as well, and we're no longer on that either. So that dynamic has kind of changed a little bit. I was just talking to Mike the other day, talking about how weird it was to not have a Kansas tag, you know, but right. we, do, we, picked up, we picked up new ground in Oklahoma this year, which we, we've hunted Oklahoma quite a bit and had a lot of success picked up some new ground there. So we were out there this summer, you know, getting familiar with it and doing what we needed to do out there to get ready for season. So I would imagine after Texas, we'll be rolling into Oklahoma. And then we don't really have that much on the the schedule after that besides home. You know, a lot of times we'll hunt the Midwest early or, or the West, out West early season. And, you know, that'll just take up so much time. And, but this year, you know, Mike did Colorado. And I did Alberta and, you know, which is not out west, but I didn't do elk hunting this year. Neither did he. It's just kind of been a light year, I guess, is the point that I'm saying. You yeah. Know, it's just, it's a lighter schedule than it has been in the past. And in a way, that's kind of nice because it spreads your hunts out a little bit longer, you know, than yeah. uh, the normal travel routines for you guys are, are pretty, pretty short and to the point. And every five days you're leaving somewhere, it makes it really hard to hunt like that, to be honest. <laughs> It does. For example, last September, I was gone. I literally was gone from Texas for one entire month. The entire month of September, I kicked off in Colorado. I was there two weeks. It was tough. Ate that tag. Rolled straight into New Mexico. Um, didn't see an elk maybe one a mile away in, in one week. It was super slow, super hot. Um, left New Mexico and went straight to Alberta and ate that tag because of weather conditions that we and we showed all this in the show. It was just one of those seasons that was tough, but it, back to back to back hunts like that. I mean, you know, it to some people it it might sound like a dream, and it is a lot of fun. But it is it's strenuous, and you know, the travel is is tough, and you know, so it, yeah, I'm kind of appreciating having a little bit lighter schedule. Although I will be missing Kansas for sure. We always yeah we always enjoy Kansas. Yeah, I'm sure. You know, and I actually, when you said that, I said cool earlier in the show, but I, I meant it as I probably knew what you were going to say that you guys had somewhere else to hunt. And it's always cool to me to have, yeah. you know, I, I'm sorry, you, you know, you guys ended up not being able to hunt Kansas or lost that ground or you guys sold it actually, but it's a new beginning somewhere else, which I think is always neat to set up a new property and hunt. And Oklahoma, uh, unlike Kansas, is a two buck state. So you guys, I mean, it's probably a little little closer to you it's drivable and uh right. it's always nice when it's a two buck state so you guys should uh, do really well there i'm sure yeah that's that is one of the benefits of it um that i mean everything you mentioned clo- closer to home and two bucks each so makes a little bit more sense for us yeah you know, for sure and, and oklahoma's been piling out the big deer i mean it's a very i wouldn't say it's um under under the radar anymore, but man, it's a great state still. 
It it is, and I think I've heard people say it's a sleeper state. And then I think Mike and I were in Oklahoma for an Orsland's opening um, a couple months ago, and and some of the people that came up to meet us and stuff were saying that they, you know, some people like the fact that you know you're kind of promoting more things in Oklahoma, and then other people are kind of like, oh, you can leave our state. Don't do it. Yeah, (laughs) get out of here. (laughs) Yeah, get out of here. Go hunt your own state. I actually had somebody tell me that on social media one time. It just cracked me up. Um, I think I killed something. I shot something in Kansas, and his comment to me was, go hunt your own state. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you've heard it all on social media. You're, For you sure. know, Yeah, but uh, with, like, like you're the first uh, in the deer hunting world, you know, to shoot a deer in Kansas, you know. So, I know. Or put it yeah, on TV definitely. or social media or anywhere else. There's people that are bored and don't have a whole lot to do, is is what I assume. So yeah, for <laughs> I sure. mean, most hunters aren't that way. You know, most hunters are generally we're all kind of have each other's backs and trying to support the same thing and be involved in the same sport and not be ugly. But everything has, you know, everything has negativity in it. So yeah, and does for sure. So, but I wanted. Uh, I mean, we talked earlier, but I was super excited to have you on today because I know you're just in Alberta. And I just love Alberta. I wish I could go every year. I think it's the neatest thing. I've only been once, but it just has burned in my memory. But uh, I think it's so neat to talk to somebody that's gone to Alberta. It's a legit bow hunting adventure. It's a hunting adventure all in one. And, I mean, you didn't just go. You went and had such great success and just you killed just an amazing, amazing mule deer. So I just wanted to kick off the end season report have you on and talk about that awesome hunt oh thank you it it was a lot of fun and i'm i mean the the spot and stock style hunting that 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 hunt is you know it's it 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 makes it um it's very challenging and i think i actually said something like that on social media it's challenging but very rewarding you know obviously when you ended up shooting a you know a nice muley like that it makes it so rewarding but you know you don't you just you never know going in on those stocks like how it's going to end you know um so that particular day that i shot that buck i mean it was it was an all-day deal i think we got out of the truck at 8 30 a.m and you know um it it was an all-day deal we were at 30 yards away from him for about five or six hours holy cow and that's some patience yeah you know i i had shot one back in 2013 um, with the same outfitter and guide, and he scored just a little bit better than this one. And the same deal, it was an all-day deal. You know, those – and and my my guy, Jason Goche, and I were talking about it, and he – you know, those those big muleys like that, not to say that the other ones, you know, aren't as keen, but, you know, they get older, they get wiser. You know, they're – you know, I remember when I first started hunting them, Mike was like, you know, they have really big ears and really big eyes and a really good nose. So <laughs> you've got to be super quiet. But they're just – you know, they're looking out, you know, they're, they're looking out and trying to figure out what's going on. And it's not like you can just get right up to them easy. So it, sometimes it can take hours just to go a few, to crawl a few inches through whatever crop you're in just to gain another yard or whatever, you know? Right. Yeah, for sure. Get a little bit, so. Well, I wanted to kind of like trace me through the steps a little bit, Bonnie. Did I take it? Did you fly into like Calgary or? Um, yes. So okay. I flew into Calgary from Houston and then, um, outfitter, he always picks me up and he's about an hour and a half east of Calgary. Okay. And he's long time, lifelong resident and, um, been there for a long, long time. And, and you guys have had, hunted with him for a long time as well, right? Yeah. He, we've hunted with him for uh, at least 10 years and, um, he's been in the outfitting business. His name's Eldon Hoff. He's been with Deer Lodge Outfitting. He's been in the outfitting business for since, I think he told me this trip since 79 or something Holy like that. Holy cow, how cool. Yeah, so he does all kinds of things. But um, awesome people. And, you know, it's it's nice for me as a female hunter to be able, I mean, this might not be an aspect that a lot of guys worry about, but as a female hunter, I completely trust them. I feel comfortable and safe with them and, um, this is a hunt that I went on, you know, I went on by myself and right. uh, met up with, met up with my cameraman and can do it, you know, not. Not having to worry you know, about anything. Yeah. Not having to worry great. about anything. Yeah, which is nice, you know, and good yeah. for you because you can't say that 
um, about going a lot of places. So it's nice to have that feeling. And even as, I mean, a guy, like I have those insecurities, to be honest. Like I don't know who I'm hunting. You know, sometimes you don't know who you're hunting with, and you never know what you're going to get into and if it's going to be a good experience or a bad one. But I know obviously you've been there, you know, over the years. But, I mean, it's just nice to be able to go and, like you say, it, it's familiar for you and you know you're, you're going to go. It's safe and you're going to have a good time and you sort of know what to expect. But that doesn't mean there's any less adventure in that by any means. Right, right. And one thing I love about I mean, this is kind of a sidetrack, is that, you know, you, you, through hunting you meet so many people and you make so many new friendships that you wouldn't have without the hunting connection. So actually the outfitter as well as the guide himself, they've both been down to Texas to spend time with me and my family, and it just becomes like that. It becomes, yeah, that's neat. you know, deeper friendships, so it's pretty cool. That is cool. So you guys jump an hour and a half in the car, head east. I think when I went I had... I I was dead south, um, about an hour and a half, kind of like you in the car, anyways. But you headed east, so I was I assume the demographics a little bit different. Uh, is there a lot of crop fields there, Bonnie? Is it real flat, or can you still see the outline of the Rockies, or what's um, the it's, terrain it's like? It's not flat. The terrain is it's kind of mixed terrain. I mean, it's not super hilly, or you know, um, but it's it's a lot of cropland. A lot of crops, okay. Fields and fields of canola. Canola and wheat. Barley, yeah. Okay. It always seems like these bucks like to hang out in the canola, but, of course, the thing is is a lot of stuff by this hunt has been swabbed already. So, you know, they're they're pushing into where they still have cover, you know. Right. And, of course, the canola is the loudest one out of the bunch. (laughs) Canola is the loudest. It's the hardest to walk through for me because, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's all, um, you know, your feet get tangled up in it at the bottom of it. So it's so funny because I'm, I always tell Jason, I'm like, can you find me one in the wheat, you know? <laughs> yeah, please. And, you know, you, but it, it obviously doesn't work like that. So yeah, the, the one that I ended up shooting was in canola and, and, you know, it makes for good cover when you can stock in, but the other challenging thing is that, you know, it's a little bit tall and obviously it was, you know, they, that's, they're in there to hide and they can sit down there in bed and you can barely see the tips of their antlers, you know, but it did make it more challenging when it came time to shoot, but yeah. I'm not trying to dump that head, but. No, that's fine. Well, let's talk about how that hunt played out. Like, so you guys got up in the morning, I assume, and, and did you, uh, or had you already spot spotted this deer or were you guys going to? hunting a new area that morning no so um it's he he basically is you know obviously my tags in a certain area and he does do a little pre-scouting before i get there um and he ha- had a couple of other hunters the, the couple of weeks leading up to me coming in so that kind of gives him time while you know to be looking too but it's really just brandon it's like you know getting up getting in the truck you know getting your your binos and you just start looking, you know, you're, you're sitting at a field somewhere before daylight and seeing what you can see, see who's on their feet. And a couple of mornings we had probably two or three mornings, we had like serious fog to where you couldn't see anything. And that just, that messes everything up because, you know, if they get up on their feet in the fog and whatever, you don't see, you can't spot anything. And then they're back down by the time the fog, fog burns off, you know, right. so weather, yeah. weather plagued me last year there and it, started off the same way here this year but yeah so you're just literally driving around and classing and then you know he knows a lot of the local people and then some of them he has to you know phone and say hey you know we've seen something here if we go in on it will you be all right with that you know right yeah so So that that morning you guys are glassing and did you just happen to get eyes on it and and how'd you guys formulate a plan to to get to it Yeah, so um, the morning, the day that I shot my buck, we spotted him first thing in the morning. And we did not have any wind at that time. You know, like my guide says, the wind blows in southern Alberta all the time, except for when sometimes when you come, Bonnie. And so for literally three days, Brandon, there was no wind. It was like two, three-mile-per-hour winds. And he was like, we need about 12 to 15, I think is what he was saying, to at least go in on something. Cover, cover so, your sound a little. That's what that does for people that don't know why you want wind, but yeah. that's why you want it. 
It covers your sound. And so fortunately that day, though, we did see that the wind was going to be picking up later that day. So the morning, we just kind of watched him that whole morning. Or, or, or no, this was the day before. What am I saying? Because we went in, we got out of the truck at 830. We saw him in the area the day before, and then we went back in the morning, and we knew we had wind then. Because there, the day before, we were saying, you know, we'd like to go in after him, but we couldn't. I'm, I'm getting confused. We couldn't because of the wind. So the next morning, we laid eyes on him, and once we had wind, we threw on our gear and went, you know, headed out. Because, you know, he, like I said before, you don't know if you're going to be out of the truck for 30 minutes or right. nine hours. Yeah. You know, and yeah. so it just all depends on, and the good thing about him was he was alone and gives you a little bit more advantage than when you have other mule deer out bedded by him, you know, it's just more eyes and ears and, and noses that can sense something's not right, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one thing I really like what you said just a second ago, and this is like, I think, key for anybody that is, is doing any, I mean, from Nebraska to Alberta, any type of mule deer hunting like that is is to be ready for a 30 minute hunt or a 30 second hunt or nine hours because as soon as you shut that truck door like it's on you might kill something Mm -hmm. somewhere five feet off the road in a patch of like four little bushes that you didn't see a deer in and it really does happen like that sometimes and sometimes it plays out to like what just happened to Bonnie where it just it ends up taking hours so uh, it's just one of those things to be mentally focused on and prepared that it, it could go either way. And actually, Brandon, halfway through that day, I thought I was going to have a shot because, you know, they're they're bedded and then they're standing. They're they're either stretching or they're feeding. You know, mostly feeding. And he stood up halfway through the day. It could have been it could have been a much easier day, but when he stood up and was feeding for a long time, he never he was in such high canola. He never gave me a shot, you know. Um, right. I'm already going into it. I know I know the canola is tall, and I know I'm going to have to kind of visualize where to place the arrow. But anyway, on that time thing, you know, there was a few times at about 1.30 in the afternoon that I thought I was about to get a shot on him. But we had to let him, when he re-bedded, boy, he re-bedded for a while. Did he really? And, oh. Yeah. Uh, for, for our, you know, and you're kind of, well, with me, in my situation, I've got another guy behind me filming, and then you've got the guy, so you've got three people crammed into one small space trying to be as quiet as possible. And and just be ready. The anticipation of, you know, him standing up and, you know, ranging and, you know, just, it's, it's exciting. I mean, it's it so is. exciting. <laughs> it is. It is such a cool hunt. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm losing my voice, but it is such a cool hunt, and uh, it's hard to, like you said, I don't know how in the world you manage patience for one person, let alone three. That's really hard to do, and being quiet, and then, you know, somebody's knees sore, back sore, and you're, you know, you kind of have to start moving, but, uh, you know, yeah. at any time, you you don't have a clue, like you just said, of when this thing's going to turn its head and when it turns its head does that mean he's going to get up or going to bound off so uh it's mm-hmm. full of adrenaline that's for sure for was, sure was he with any other deer bunny or just by himself no he was just by himself which like i was saying earlier was a bit of a blessing on my part because there's been plenty of times we tried to stalk in on on you know on some muleys and they just there's too many of them and they bust you you know so, Absolutely. Yeah. Even though, you know, you're pl- you're obviously playing the wind and coming in, you know, where they're not going to be able to smell you, and but somebody can step on something, you know, and make a noise that they that they pick up on is not normal. And right. like you said, they're bound they're bounding off. Yeah. Did you guys have to do anything crazy to make a play on the wind, or was it just kind of in your favor and you guys got the, you know, basically beeline right towards them? Um, yeah, there was nothing really crazy. It just, you know, obviously you're going to come in downwind and, you know, we just had to figure out, well, actually, I'm trying to think we went in on him and then we did have to kind of turn around and go back a different direction. Oh, I know what it was because at the very beginning of the stock, not right by him, but there was two does bedded like on a hillside that we couldn't see. And the way we were going at him at the beginning those does were bedded there, so we kind of turned around and made an alternate plan because, you know, even though they weren't that close to each other, we still didn't want to bust them and have them, 
running out of there and, you know, alarming him in any way. Right. You know, so right. it's just it's just being very careful and very cautious and every step of the way, and I mean every footstep of the way. Right. Yeah. Well, that's neat, too, that you guys had to kind of avoid those does that makes for an exciting hunt, you know, and just mm-hmm. part of it, just another part. But, uh, man, you, that deer is just so awesome and it's so unique. Well, let me back up before I get to how cool your deer is. But so you are you got to what? What was the final mark, like at 30 yards or 25 yards, you said? The final mark was 30 yards. And okay. And we were sitting at him for a while at 45, and he said, I think I can gain a little more ground if you – and I said, that would be awesome, you know. So um, we got into 35, and then he moved a little bit closer to us, and I think we adjusted a little bit and ended up giving me a 30-yard shot. So that was that was a blessing and you know, but like I said before, just trying to be trying to be quiet at thirty yards for that long of a period of time. It's so hard. Yeah. <laughs> so hard. My knees hurt just thinking about that, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> all of our knees and our back we were all like, uh, oh, we're due we're all due for some kind of massage. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I bet. So what happened? Did he just end up standing up in the middle of the day to readjust or how did you end up um, actually getting a shot? Did he kind of look yeah, at you guys, actually, or was he looking away? He never, ever, never saw us. Um, he was, when I shot him, his head was actually down. He was feeding. And, I mean, he just he had just gotten up on his feet to, to start eating a little bit. And he was on his feet for about probably 15 minutes before I got my shot. Oh, wow. And, I mean, obviously – my guide is poking his head up a little bit with this, you know, glassing and, you know, constantly monitoring the situation. And then he sat down and he looked at me and he said, stand up and shoot. And I mean, those are the, those are the words I'm waiting for, for like the last, I forget how many hours, you know? And so I had, you know, at that point he and I had already communicated the range, you know, I had already, you know, seen kind of where he was standing a little bit by poking up, you know, a little bit over the canola and because, I mean, I, I never want to just pop up and like not know where the animal's at. And it's right. very yeah. possible that's, in that That's crop hard. Like that. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 So, that would um, give somebody well, target panic in a heartbeat, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, that's how, that's how that went. And I mean, they, they kept telling me, you know, when they were glassing him from a distance, Harmon and Jason, they were telling me, you know, he looks to be like he's a pretty big, he, he might be in the 190s. But I just, you know, I re- really didn't even look at his rack that much. I mean, it wasn't that visible anyway, and I try not to focus on that. So, right. I so mean, you, when the, sorry, when, go ahead, when I laid eyes on him. Oh, I'm sorry. When I laid eyes on him, I was like, oh, okay, wow. <laughs> you know? Yeah, he's, he's way bigger than I thought. Yeah. Yeah, and the fact that he was kind of still half, you know, a little bit in velvet. Yeah, I was going to mention that, how how unique. And uh, just overall, his frame is so unique. Uh, it's almost whitetail-like, if you ask me, but, you know, but it, he does have those, you know, deep forks, you know. But his some of his frame just reminds me of a really cool whitetail, but he's uh, just such a, a mega mule deer. It's just awesome. And the, the velvet so so unique. It's awesome. That's exactly what they were saying. They were calling him a white tail mule, mule deer because, you know, like you said, his characteristics kind of look that way. And but, um, you know, one thing that Eldon, the outfitter, was saying, well, you know, well, he's out there on all that cropland. He doesn't have anywhere to rub that velvet off on. <laughs> you know, he's not. Yeah, that's like, probably true. It's probably hard. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't think of that. So, he probably doesn't get too many fence posts that don't have barbed wire around them. Right. You know, not a lot of trees. Yeah, but you have I probably no trees gonna, out there. I'm going to try to go ahead and mount him with, you know, if if it preserved right coming home, I'm going to mount him with, with the velvet like that. Yeah, I think that would look pretty cool. Yeah, it would be, yeah. It's neat because it's literally like, you know, d- almost dangling off. You know, it's not like a Kentucky whitetail in velvet. It's a, you know, like he's he's just about got it all off, but he's got some cool parts where it's still hanging on. Um, yeah, it, that, that's right. Sorry, Mike just clicked in on my uh, on our conversation. And I was oh, that's trying right. to tell him. <laughs> so, that's all right. Um, 
But it looks yeah, like, but unless I'm wrong, does he have one time that is completely in velvet still? I can't um, I think it was. Let me look at the picture. Yeah, I think his uh, right side basically would be like his G2. Mm-hmm. But still completely in velvet, yep. yeah. Yeah. And then the rest of it's kind of like shredded off, which is really neat looking. Mm-hmm. So, so what happened after you put Arrow in them, Bonnie? How how far did you go, and did you guys get to see him fall? We didn't get to see him fall. He ran off, and um, we did not get to see him fall. So we kind of we kind of lost him for a little bit, and because of the fact that he was in the uh, you know Paul Canola, like I'm talking about. Yeah, it's hard to know, see. I, I, it's hard to see. So. We actually gave him time. We um, that night we did not, we didn't find him that night. We found him the next morning, which was very like stressful and disappointing for me because no, for sure, yeah. You know when something like that happens, you you know, and he just he, he slipped off, and at that point we could not see anything, Brandon. So we were like, we don't know if we're if he's alive and we're going to push him. We don't know if he went over that you know, hill and died, and, I mean, we just felt we were losing light, and they, the, the best decision that we felt like we could do was just back out and and not go in after him, so. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, it, 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 it leaves you unsettled, you know, the unsettling feeling like you might have done something wrong, and uh, mm-hmm. it doesn't look like, from what I can see, you did anything wrong, but... Uh, but it's no. still nonetheless when you don't know, you don't know, and it, and that feeling alone is just, you know, it's a little stressful. Yeah, and my shot was, you know, it was literally right, very close to the pocket, and but a little low, you know, and so we didn't see any blood. That's the thing. We found the arrow; it was a complete pass through, and we didn't see any blood. So we were just, we were just nervous about the whole thing. And you know, I've been in situations before where you don't know and. You push something, and you know, with that deer, I was just like, I'm, I'm not going to do that. And so I had a sleepless yeah. night. And before the sun came up, we were sitting where he, where we saw him, where we last saw him go. And we went in, and he was, he happened to, you know, be in the field and found him. I was able to recover him and everything. And it, I mean, it made me so happy because, you know, sometimes you'll have endings that aren't quite like that, you know, but I knew as soon as I stood up, you know, as soon as I, or as soon as I stood up and made my shot, you know, they both looked at me and said, how do you feel? And I said, I feel really good about that shot. You know, right. you know yeah. sometimes you just feel it, you, but of course we went back and looked at the footage. You can see nothing, you know? Yeah. The canola's covering everything and yeah, that's a yeah. bummer. So but at least you knew. So that was nice, you know, but nonetheless, it's never fun not to sleep. But um, like I said, I mean, I can tell you, you looks like you've just about 10 ringed it, but uh, it's, uh, it's always a bummer. That's like one of the reasons why the, it's so great to video because you always get to check those shots. And uh, when an arrow disappears like that, especially in all that tall grass and canola or crops or whatever, it, you know, it's like, oh man, like you don't have your answer yet. You know, you don't get that you know, confirmation that it was a ten ring. Yeah, you don't have your answer, and boy, is it just, you just start thinking all kinds of things. You can start thinking the worst, or, you know, I, you just don't know, because, because of the, I mean, we knew we had a pass-through, so, you know, but exactly where, you know, was, was the question, and when I, when I saw where I hit him, I was so relieved, you know. Yeah, um, absolutely, yeah. Because I, all- I never... Like as an archery hunter, I don't ever want to take an unethical shot or, or a shot, you know, the animal going down is my biggest priority, you know, and I don't want anything, you know, suffering or whatever. So for sure, that's why, yeah. obviously, that's why we all practice and we're all trying to be the best that we can at it, you know. Yeah, and, for sure. Yep. Nope, but, absolutely. But it's, a, it's a good lesson because it's like it, it doesn't always end exactly how you want it to end, but it's still a good ending, but. Yes, right. But part of it, the lesson is, like, you remembered the bad. You know, that that little bit of stressful feeling just reminds you of, like, man, that, that's why I shoot every day, you know, or that's why I shoot so often, and that's why I practice. And 
that's why I, you know, use top of the line gear and check my gear and make sure it's working and, uh, uh, you know, all those things lead to, you know, usually more success. But uh, it does happen and it's never fun when it does happen for sure. But least least outcome was the right outcome for you. Right. And, you know, as soon as, I mean, back about shooting and stuff, I mean, if, if I travel anywhere with, just like everybody does, I mean, the first thing you do is you're shooting, you know, at the outfit or wherever you're at and making sure that everything was on with your bow, you know, nothing got messed up in flight or anything like that. And so in that, in that aspect, I was all good. I knew I was, I knew I was all good. So. Right. Gear was ready to go. You just had to make the shot. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, you did. So, but congrats on that. It's such a great deer. I was super proud of you. And, uh, you know, I was excited to get you here and share the story because I was like, man, that's a deer of a lifetime. And uh, Bonnie's one of my favorite hunters, so I, I knew it would be a good time with you today. Well, thank you so much. Thanks again for having me. I appreciate it. And and I hope that you have a good season and that all your listeners have a good season. And um, hopefully maybe I'll have some luck in Texas this weekend. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, hopefully so. And if you do, shoot me a text, and we'll we'll get back on the podcast and do another end season report because I definitely will be following along with you guys on your Instagram, which is Legends of the Fall TV, and uh, Bonnie and the crew there. That you guys are really current on on your content, like when a hunt happens, which I always appreciate it. And uh, it's it's so bizarre the world we live in, but that's like how I, you know follow along with Bonnie and, and Mike and the rest of the game. And it's like, you know, you know when they had a good hunt. And, uh, you know, at least, like I said, kudos to you guys. You do it really current and timely fashion. and uh, But uh, for sure, I hope you Thank guys you. have really good success in Texas and the new farm in Oklahoma. I hope to hear about it soon. Okay. Well, thank you so much for having me, Brandon. I appreciate it. All right, Bonnie. We'll talk to you guys soon and and tell everybody I said hello and uh, best of luck for the rest of the season. Okay. Thank you. Take care. And every week you can find Take Aim Outdoors on iTunes, the Outdoor Podcast channel on iTunes, and the Unfiltered Outdoor app. If you have not already, make sure you check out the new updates to the Unfiltered Outdoor app. The new app is pretty dang awesome if I say so myself, so make sure you check that out. We'll catch you guys right here next week. (laughs) 